Used to hobo a right smart back in the 30s. There wasn't no work. I don't care what you could do. I was riding through the mountains one night, state of Colorado. Dead of winter it was and bitter cold. I had just a smidgen of tobacco, about enough for one or two smokes. I was in one of them old slat-sided cars, and I'd been up and down in it like a dog trying to find some place where the wind wouldn't blow. Directly, I scrunched up in a corner and rolled me a smoke and lit it and throwed the match down. Well, there was some sort of stuff on the floor about like tinder, and it caught fire. I jumped up and stomped on it, and it ain't done nothing but burn faster. Within two minutes, the whole car was afire. I run to the door and got it open, and we was going up this grade through the mountains and the snow with the moon on it, and it was just blue looking and dead quiet out there and them big old black pine trees going by. I jumped for it and lit in a snow bank, and what I'm going to tell you, you'll think peculiar, but it's the God's truth. That was in 1931, and if I live to be a hundred year old, I don't think I'll ever see anything as pretty as that train on fire going up that mountain and around the bend and them flames lighting up the snow and the trees and the night. Remarkable passage of dialogue there from Sutri's friend. Do you guys know what the sublime is when someone talks about the sublime? What is the sublime? You've probably heard all your life that this or that is sublime. Do you know what it means? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> it's either a band from the 90s or... A kind of vapor. Kind of vapor. I've never heard that. Anyone else, when you say, when you say oh, wow, that was sublime, what are, you what, are you, what are you saying? It's like good. It's positive. It's good. Blame. What kind of good is it? Overwhelmingly good. Overwhelmingly good. Yes, cat. Yeah, awe-inspiring good to the point of being supernatural. When we say something is awe-inspiring, when we say something is awesome, not in the sense, everything is awesome now. You have a cheese sandwich, it's awesome. You, you know, Oh, my Uber's on the way, awesome. Like, it doesn't mean anything anymore. But what, what is awe-inspiring supposed to conjure? Like, when do you have awe? Okay, borderline unbelievable. Cat, you said something about almost supernatural. Takes your breath away. Takes your breath away, right? There's that first line of um, one of Rilke's Dueno elegies. All angels are terrible, and terrible in the sense that they are, you know, they're bright like God with supernatural force. And to look upon the face of that unmediated is to confront something as a human being that's too much. Sublime is this weird concept that has somewhat faded out of use, but it's meant, and people will quibble with this, but one way of thinking about it is it's a marriage of beauty and terror in equal parts, right? So often it can be a, an image of disaster but there is something beautiful in that image of disaster and destruction. It's, in the true sense, terrible. And not terrible is like, oh, I don't like that. One out of five stars would not recommend. Not in that sense. Terrible in the sense of the way God is spoken about in the Old Testament. Our God is a terrible God. He's, there's terror when human beings confront that that melding, that wedding of beauty and terror simultaneously. And Cormac, among other great artists, um, great American artists, novelists, he loves those two things, wedding those two things together, and how they can come from things that are as uh, pedestrian as a train, <clears throat> pardon me, going through the mountains and being on fire. And all of that together conjures this image. You guys know what I'm saying? Yeah. So a lot of religious imagery in this chunk of Sutri 
we read for today. And I'm thinking about a large-ish kind of question for you guys. What role does Sutri fill for the lost souls he interacts with in this book? I'm talking about Harrogate and Leonard and all of them. He's filling some kind of bizarre role. And what is that? Ivy? To me, it almost seems as like a voice of reason. Almost like, or like a voice of like guidance more so. To kind of reason or guidance. Is guidance reasonable? Depends on the situation. Okay. Others of you, what kind of role do you think Sutri's filling? For these lost souls he interacts with. Yeah. I think he's sort of a um, a listening ear, just sort of a lack of a better word, a wall to talk to. Okay, so one of the roles. What do you call? What's the religious terminology for for a listening ear? Yeah. So one of Sutri's roles is that of confessor. Absolutely. Like he listens to the plights of these folk who aren't doing well. He's not doing so great himself, but he he's able to listen. Yes, ma'am. He kind of provides like a, a helping hand there that whatever people need. So I'm thinking about ministry, yeah, as a minister. Ministry in the sense of um when I grew up, there were a lot of televangelists. There may still be a lot of televangelists. I just don't know where they broadcast. But all of those, they were mostly men then. Um, a lot of those men had ministries for the poor or something. You know, they you know feed the children kind of operations. Um, maybe that money got to the people it was intended for. Maybe it didn't. I don't know. Um, but... I always thought of ministry uh, in those terms, the kind of, you know, Christ's um, commandment that you love your neighbors yourself and you go and if there are people who, who are hungry, you feed them. And if there are people who don't have clothes, you clothe them. And so, so Sutri certainly does that. What are the other roles that Sutri fills, particularly like religious ones? Elizabeth? I think of like giving alms to the poor, like he gives people money and alms and stuff like that, and so I think that's the main role. Yeah, he, he lends people money. He almost, yeah, he's almost always giving beggars or people on the street money, um, and also kind of, what would you call someone who sorts people out, like people kind of come to him and he organizes where they ought to be. I see Sutri doing this all the time. Hey, did you know about this guy needs this thing? I mean, I'm sorry? Well, I mean, there is, there is some sense of like counseling. You know, we're back to the confessor thing of him. And like an organizer, you know, just someone who's there to kind of connect people together. Did you know about this? Did you know about that? Hmm. What, is, what do you call that, visiting the sick? What is that called? I don't know. I think of that in terms of ministry, but there are people, you know, pastors used to, maybe they still do, they go around with smaller congregations and, you know, visit the elderly, visit the sick, the infirm, um, look in on people, which I think, like, that, that kind of Christianity um, makes all kinds of sense to me. Like, that seems like grounded in the needs of people and in alleviating suffering, um, which is in large part what Sutri, I don't know if he's committed to it. He just can't help from doing it. He can't help himself because he, he feels like out of some sense of noblesse oblige or something else, like he's got to minister to these people. And also, like, what would happen 
Well, we know the answer to some of this. What would happen to some of these folks if it weren't for Sutri? Well, some would probably be dead. Well, Harrogate for sure. We'll talk about Harrogate's Harold Gates <laughs> molish behavior beneath the, the mole man the mole man of Knoxville going into the bowels of hell. And also he says there were people talking to me. There were people down here. It's kind of interesting. Sutri, like even in these moments of profane, in these profane spaces like some dive bar, right? Sutri is involved in a, in a melee, an absolute Donnybrook, right? And when the floor buffer gets dropped on his head, he sees briefly like the, I mean, hallucination or whatever you want to call it, he sees the face of like a crone, like a witch, like a hag. And then later on, interestingly, he visits this woman who is called a witch, right? And she'll, she'll come back. Um, she's the woman that Ab Jones wants to come and see him. So if you're not of, if you've rejected your faith that you're born into and you're like traveling along the margins, people like still reach out to men and women of God or of gods or they still need that kind of thing, right? So you get the goat man, you know, preaching his goat sermons with his goats, right? You have, you have those sorts of figures who, like, it makes sense why the police officer in Knoxville doesn't want the goat, as he says, shitting on the lawn, right? Uh, but there's also a kind of, like, a kind of sweetness to that, like, just a, just a man with his goats. It, it seems like a kind of the figure of the shepherd, you know, wandering through the countryside, you know, ministering where he can, tending his goats. Like, there's a kind of, there's a kind of mythology to that. And in a way, I mean, you could also say Sutri sort of takes on sort of the role of, of shepherd, shepherd as well. When he's, you know, he's gathering these people. He, again, he is a form of, as we've said, guide. He's also again helping these people and then trying to get them along. Like I mean, I mean obviously he's like the extent he goes to Harrogate and like goes like above and beyond. But like a lot of these others too, he's like because there was Leonard as well. When he I was, was getting ready to mention Leonard. Because it was Leonard. Basically. Helps perform a burial. Yeah, at river. At river, <laughs> not sea, but at river. And then like says, like he can't help himself. Mm -hmm. Don't you want to say a few words? And Leonard's like, huh? <laughs> Right, that's the that's the level of Leonard's commitment to um, civilization or whatever it is that that is culture, whatever is represented. He just wants the money that they that they get drawing from the dead man. Boy, a dead guy in a house it smells real bad. I, I I wouldn't think that. I know people do. We know people do because we get these okay. true crime stories. I wouldn't think a person, leave aside the emotional, moral, um, all that stuff, right? I wouldn't think you could live in a house with that. Like the smell, I would think, would be overpowering. If you've been in the woods very much, or just like out running on a trail, and you, you, know, you come by where like there's a dead animal, like you know, uh, an armadillo. Do you have armadillos out here? Anyway, back home it was armadillos. Yeah. It's always like a raccoon or like... You know, like possum or something like that, right? I mean, you can, Skunk. that sickly sweet smell, right? It's just, you know, it's awful and overpowering. And that's passing by in the open air breeze, etc. right? You can't wait to get away from it. So when Sutri decides to descend into the underworld to help his friend, I mean, you want to talk about mythic. I mean, this, you know, the, the myth, of, and there, there are all these myths in the ancient world of the person. It's generally a man who goes, like, down into the underworld yeah. or down into suffering. Orpheus. And, yeah, yeah, Orpheus, right? So the, the brief story of Orpheus and Eurydice, Eurydice is put into the underworld. Um, 
Orpheus goes to rescue her, right? Tries to bring her up out of hell. Generally, those stories go wrong. Like, you're not able to quite get there. I was also thinking about part of the Christ story that is not emphasized as much is that Jesus dies on a Friday and then he descends into the underworld, right? And quote, Harrow's hell. So the idea is that he um, recruits, scoops up whatever, the souls that are uh, the righteous souls that were in what some Jewish people at the time thought of as called Abraham's bosom, right? And then takes them to paradise. Um, you know, so descends, Harrow's hell, and then rises again. So you have that kind of circular sort of thing. I'm sure that, I'm not saying these things are co-equal. I'm saying they exist in other cultures. Uh, you know, Osiris descending into yep. the underworld, right? I'm on shaky ground, I don't know, Egyptian theology. But you have these, these heroes or god figures who make their descent and then rise again, having triumphed over death. Of course, Dante does this in his journey through the underworld. We were talking about that with Outer Dark. <laughs> Why does he go after Harrogate? Why do that? I mean, he's going into a really precarious situation. And there's no, there's no promise that if you go into the caves under Knoxville looking for Harrogate, you're going to find him. I mean, you're talking about these winding, twisting. I I don't like like tight spaces myself, so that that seems like a particular kind of sacrifice. Why why do that? Why go after Harrogate? I think he's gotten used to kind of looking after Harrogate, and he feels so much responsibility for him. So he goes to look in. Yes, ma'am. I think that is a great insight. After the death of Sutri's son, he comes back and he starts actively looking into Harrogate, seeing about him as kind of more assertive than like, Gene, don't do that. Gene, don't do this, right? Um, the whole thing with Thanksgiving, I thought was pretty. I thought it was pretty moving. He wakes up and it's really cold, and you know his egg like rolls under like a rock rolls under the bed. And then he immediately starts going around to his people and like figuring out how he can get Thanksgiving dinner for himself and for Harrogate, thinking about, um, you know, this there was the rag picker. You'll, you know, you'll freeze up in here. Let's get you to someplace warm. And like he immediately like starts making this rotation. You had something. Um, yes. brother was still born so he never really got to grow up and know what it was like to have a brother and I feel like he's kind of um, putting Harrogate in that position taking him like under his wing um, whether a fatherly or a brotherly big brother relationship it is that kind of familial thing also Harrogate is so vulnerable and so stupid <laughs> just the stuff he does is just actively one after, and you just get the hits. Key, yeah, the hits keep on coming with the electrifying, electrocuting pigeons, the the, the slingshot strychnine at bats. I mean, one scheme after another, right? And then as soon as Harrogate's like, there's some caves. You're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and that has been set up since the um, preface, right? Where you have the italicized section. You know, a little. There's a mention of these, you know, caves, and you're like, okay, we're eventually going to go down into the underworld of Knoxville. What does an underworld represent? I know that, like, in Christian theology, um, it's a place of punishment and a place of separation for the sinful. 
Um, in a more general sense, and in other mythologies, what does the underworld represent? Why, why would storytellers need to world build in such a way that they create an underworld? Yeah. Well, I know, I know at least the idea behind it is, I would assume, I don't know for cer certain, but I think that they would possibly, to, to the idea of there is something next, there is something, there is something uh, past what we have now that we can get to. Because not, because all, although underworlds typically follow the same kind of formula, mm -hmm. some of them are, there are some areas within them, at least that is assumed that is, that there is a light on the end of the tunnel, even though there's like this dark place that you're basically going through, there is a light, there is a better place. Mm -hmm. even but why have it be under as opposed to over? I think it's like, um, like, a, like another layer of, of our world that is kind of existing at, at the same time as, as ours is, but like this world is kind of more like unseen. Like the ghosts and the spirits, they exist right alongside us within this like underworld. That, yeah, in, if I'm watching any kind of story, if I'm taking in any kind of story in any medium, and they go into the caves or the wells or the under or the mines or the whatever, I always get a little excited. Like going to the place that's unknown, the place that's dark. And you know, if you're like watching or reading for the first time, Lord of the Rings, you know, we're gonna try, we're gonna try to go over the pass in the mountains, and you're like, I don't want to go. <laughs> You know, Gimli's there. We could take the mines of Moria, right? <laughs> you know you're going to go to the mines of Moria. I think the first time I read it, I was like, well, why not just you know, go there? And it's like, okay, we're going to the mines of Moria. That's like, I love that kind of stuff. Like, that's my favorite part of the story is when you go, when you go down into the murk. It's charged with danger and with the unexplained and with mystery. Um, if you disappoint your reader... <laughs> If you disappoint your audience at that part, at that point in the story, you're liable to lose your audience forever. Of course, Tolkien doesn't disappoint. He gives like the best possible thing you could have, right? This critter that that resembles some things we know, but it's not a dragon. We've we've had a dragon in Tolkien before. It's you know, it's this thing. It's a Balrog, right? Well, what is a Balrog? It has all these? It's well. He doesn't need to go into great exposition. Whatever it is, it's a match for Gandalf. And we know Gandalf's qualities, and now there's this other thing, right? Mm -hmm. And having the characters, other characters, react to this thing, Legolas says, I believe he literally says, i.e., a Balrog. And, like, throws down his, his bow, and I can't help that that's what he says, but that's what he says, right? Legolas doesn't like it. We haven't seen Legolas scared before. So don't disappoint your readers when you take them to the underworld. Um, Harrogate thinks he's going to blow his way, dynamite his way into a vault. Of course, doesn't know anything about shock waves, blast waves. He ruptures a sewer main. It just seems like the worst possible kind of thing. And then Sutri is able to rescue him and harrow this hell and bring back his pale sewage covered Eurydice. Page 255 Sutri drunk visits a church and sits there and thinks about when he used to go to church and what his uh, childhood was like, what it all means. This closely resembles a passage from the eighth chapter of James Joyce's Ulysses. Um, and it's the chapter in Joyce's Ulysses that corresponds to the Hades episode in the Odyssey. And in the Ulysses chapter, Leopold Bloom attends the funeral of uh, one of his friends, a guy named Patty Dignam. Um, and Bloom has been raised Jewish, and he goes to this Catholic funeral, and he's, it's, really interesting because as an outsider to that faith, he's looking around trying to figure out what everything means in this really in this really interesting way. Sutri, though he's an insider, is drunk and has been away from this stuff for a while, right? So this this conjures that uh, very powerfully for me, conjures um, Joyce's episode. 
Um, when the priest comes around and asks if, if he's waiting for confession, Sudri says um, that he isn't, and that he corrects the priest. You know, the priest says God's house is not exactly a, the place to take a nap. And Sudri says it's not God's house. The priest, I beg your pardon? Sudri again, it's not God's house. What do you think Sutri means here? I think this is fairly significant too. I think again, going back to the to the brother thing, he he uh, quotes that the idea is his brother in his death is in the more righteous place in heaven, while this material world that he's in with uh, that Sutri claims is in is hell. So he claims the world he's in is hell, and is and hell is this place outside. And with that mentality. If you believe this is the hell, this is not God's house. You are in the hell. Okay. So, like, I think that's an interesting reading, the brother reading. What else does he mean by, like, this isn't God's house? How do you guys take that? If a church isn't God's house, where's God's house? Okay, why not? Tell me more about that. Well, uh, there's two ways this could go. One, uh, back to his um, like anti-materialism, anti-wealth um, like stance, where people who actually mean something, people who actually matter, they don't have houses, they don't live in the upper echelon. They just sort of believe are everywhere. And then one in the more atheistic sense, where he just can't bring himself to believe in a God. What happens to people who don't have homes? You kind of have to make do with whatever is within your town. Sure, but what happens to them? What, what is the effect on human beings of not having a domicile? Go into survival mode. Go, you go into more of a survival mode? You feel lost. You can feel lost without a home, right? A home as an idea is, is pretty fundamental to human beings, right? Even if it's a place that is not um, impressive or, you know, opulent. It's not exactly Mar-a-Lago, right? <laughs> Still, I mean, your home's your home. I, I, I think about, like, you know, the whole man cave kind of aspect of like a bear in a cave that's you know this is where you're safe this is your sanctuary this is where you refuel the jets this is where you can let your guard down etc cetera, etc cetera. this is where you have um, stores of the things that bring you comfort and and help you get along right this is where you go to prepare the face that you present to the world in order to make a living um, whatever that might be you had something about God's house, like the church not being God's house, I think. Me? I thought you had raised your hand, yeah. Um, I was just kind of thinking how God didn't build the church. It was men who built the church. And so even if, how do people know that it's God's house when all it is is men carrying out what they think is God's action? Yeah, well, the idea of a church it's quite interesting, a play, like a common space where you go to attend to this part of your life, a spiritual part of your life. And that's pretty um, uniform across various cultures, whether it's a, you know, a synagogue or a mosque or a temple or you know, some kind of place that is imbued with the things of the spirit supernatural things or is dedicated to um, the pursuit of spiritual matters. Why do you think people built churches in the first place? Like built like physical houses of worship. Community. It's like all of them together in one location. It's a brain system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You get you build a an actual sanctuary for people to get to. And they can pursue this kind of thing together. Um, if Sutri doesn't believe this is God's house, I mean, the questions I begin to have is, whose house does Sutri believe it is? Yeah. 
And perhaps you believe it's man's house, as you said, right? It's just the house of, of men or wealthy men. Sutri doesn't seem to dispute the existence of God. I think back to the, his conversation with the rag picker, right? He's like, I, I, I always did believe there was a God. I just didn't like him, which is a di very different theology than, oh, I, I don't think God exists. I'm an atheist. I just reject God. To be like, um, I always did believe in God. I just didn't like him. Well, that's something we, it's not quite something we've grappled with. Um, if God isn't in that house, where is he? If this isn't God's house, where is God's house? I think uh, probably just nature in general. If he's I thought I might get nature. I thought people might say nature. What is nature? What is that? I hear. I mean, I don't think it's um, an uninsightful thing to say at all. I think it, it makes sense. Where is this nature I always hear about? Where is that? All around us, I suppose. Where? Here? It could be. Well, not, is that what you mean? When we say nature, do I mean this? Usually not, no. It's just kind of how things play out, I guess. Abstract. Is it nature abstract or is it an actual place? I feel like nature isn't necessarily a place, more of a concept. Okay, and what is the concept? It's like the the ever changing, like instinctual, like interactions between creatures on Earth. Okay, you had a hand up about nature. Um, I think nature, in Sutri's case, nature would be wherever people are not. Mm. I don't think he thinks God is interrupted. And honestly, his entire stance for God's kind of rem reminds me of uh, Soren Kierkegaard. Um, he made a statement uh, in one of his uh, pieces uh, talking about his belief in God and saying, I believe in God because I love my father. And people who have that good relationship with their father tend to believe in God. So it's kind of interesting with um, Sutri because he has such a terrible, negative, awful mm -hmm. relationship with his father. I kind of wonder how much he associates this higher power with him. Mm -hmm. I, think there, I think there's a natural to some degree, a natural association that people make between their father and God. I, th I, think, that's a, I think that's a thing, that a real thing that happens. Kat? Um, I think talking about nature in the sense of like where humans are not is kind of an unnecessary division that makes sense. Okay, tell me about it. I'd like that a lot. Yeah, I love that one. I really in, in the Christian canon, it's the idea that religious conventions that are human made can't be confining to God. And while I don't know if Satri necessarily believes in God or has strong convictions in that sense, mm -hmm. I think to talk about God as in nature is still like the opposite kind of division. Mm -hmm. God can't be in here because he's out there. And what you're pointing to is a belief that God cannot be housed right. or contained, right? That, that that's his nature. Uh, the nature of God is that he is that which is not contained. He is that which cannot be housed. He's that which is, um, exists beyond our ability to constrain and confine him. And also to like define him, right? Say, so, oh, this, this is God. And this is exactly what he, he is, and he's not anything else but this. And it seems like in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, anyone who, like, like, I have God figured out, I have Jesus figured out, like, that's a bad day for that character, right? That person doesn't fare well in the stories. I mean, whether your name's Jonah and you're on the run, right, and you think, oh, I can, I'll get on a ship and I'll sail away from God, whatever it might be, like, God finds you, or you lose yourself, and in that place that you're lost, you realize that God is there too. 
So like all those ideas are swirling around for me. Let me ask a question that's going to get me in all kinds of trouble. Have any of you ever, would you ever say, or would any of you say that you had felt the presence of God? And if you have or had, where was it? You don't, you don't have to, like, you don't, you don't lose points if you haven't felt the presence of God. I've never felt the presence of God, but there have been moments, especially like after a loss, where I feel like the presence of that person. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. never the presence of God. It's more about the people who I care about rather than. Mm-hmm. I think that's a powerful experience. That's definitely. Has any, will anyone confess to like, oh, I felt the presence of God, or is that something that has not, is foreign to you guys? You don't, and you also don't have to tell me. Well, mine is a bit weird because. I like it already. I was, because I was, because I, again, I've, I've been raised Catholic and I still consider myself as such, but because the, the, the teachings, at least the teachings is that he's kind of just everywhere at once, so he's like an always present force. So it's kind of so, in a technical sense, I guess I can always see him. Mm-hmm. Sure. Again, it's weird. I think every time that I've like felt God, it's always been with very like emotional scenes. Like I've been surrounded by people who were very emotional, and me myself, I got very emotional. And it was in like the middle of like crying, or even if it's a happy cry, or like whatever it is, that that got me when I felt the presence of. Mm-hmm. I was really feeling something or if I was just like emotional and I think mm-hmm. but you've I think it's very interesting in a heightened emotional state yeah. you have often thought I, I feel the presence of God yeah. but you you've ex- experienced other heightened emotional states or you experienced other you've been emotional a bunch over the course of your life right yeah. and not all of those times did you think Right? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I have never felt like the presence of God, but I definitely, in a way, felt like the absence of God. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. That's interesting. I was like, I've been in some pretty rough, like, mental health stuff. I've been suicidal before. Mm -hmm. And that kind of loneliness and isolation and depression, there's, like, this absence of something to, like, save you. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you don't, and there's there's like, God was like, wasn't there to save me. Mm-hmm. So I had to save me. Mm-hmm. And just the idea of like not feeling as absent, like an absence, there is an idea that there is a presence somewhere. And the closest I've ever gotten to that is just through the love and support of like other people around me. That's mm-hmm. the closest I think I felt to like a presence of God. Mm-hmm. I love everything you just said. I think it's fantastic. For me, it's almost like I feel the presence of God, but it's like an opposite way in a sense of like God is seems to never be on my side almost. Maybe you're on the wrong side. Yeah, but I feel like there's a lot of things that aren't necessarily something I can just up and change. Like, I've dealt with a lot of loss in my life. Mm-hmm. And, like, there comes a point where you're just like, this, this guy must be just messing with me at this point. Like he, he God, must, you mean? Yeah. He must have something against me in particular. Mm-hmm. And then also, like, a common thing. It would, can like, I ask a question? Could, yeah. Without everyone getting mad? Mm-hmm. That's what people say on the internet. Can I ask a question? Without, no, I'm seriously, though. Do you think it's possible, like, we have... We've applied all of our democratic, egalitarian ideas to like everything, and maybe our egalitarian ideas don't apply to absolutely everything. Is it possible that God might not be on our side? You know what I mean? Like people are like, oh, well, God loves everybody, right? And I'm not saying he doesn't, but I'm saying is it possible that maybe God's not on some people's side? Yeah, and I kind of feel that a lot also because, I mean, 
I'm a member of the LGBT community. And that's, like, a common thing is, like, oh, like, God hates gay people, this and that and the other. Mm-hmm. And I'm just, like, you know, like, kind of fits the bill. Like, hasn't really done anything that's made me feel like he likes me as a person. So, you know, why not stop there? Well, that's interesting, right? Like, that you, to some degree, you've uh, internalized that idea that if you say, um, you said people say that God hates LGBT people, right? Yeah. Like, if you've internalized that idea from other people, Mm -hmm. maybe you do feel a sense of being, I don't want to say against God, but like... uh, Like, we're not on the same page. You're not on the same page or on the same team or something like that. I think it's I think it's fascinating, and I think these are the kinds of things that I'm most interested in when we talk about um, theology and literature and everything. Like, what what is your experience of this thing? You know, not, not what, and it's not inconsequential what came out of a book or what came out of your religious training or what came out of your lack of religious training. But what I'm always moved by and fascinated by is when people talk about their own experience. Do people like, like you said so eloquently and beautifully, um, you know, I was in this low place and I felt this absence of God and maybe that absence was part of being in that low place, right? And, and also, does that absence imply a presence? I think it's fascinating and very real. And you're saying like, I'm a member of this community and this community is often seen as being outside the, what would you say, favor of God in yeah. some way, right? And so you feel this sense of opposition. It's the only way where, like, I believe in God, but I'm not devoted to it. It reminds me of the rag picker, right? I always did believe in God, I just never did like it. I think for me, this was, like, a really interesting question to think about because I, neither of my parents are religious. Like, I was not raised religiously. Religion was just, like, never a part of my life. something that I thought about and so it's like when you ask that question it was like have I ever felt it and my first answer was no because like I I never like I don't think I would have recognized it if I had noticed it I guess but like I feel like I similar to Ivy I feel like I have a bit of a complicated relationship with religion because I'm also a member of the LGBT community and I I've had different experiences with different people. Like, I've had some, and when I say that, I mostly mean people on campus that Mm -hmm. have, you know, set up, like, preachers on campus. Mm -hmm. I've had some look me in the eyes and tell me that God hates me Mm -hmm. and I'm going to hell. But then I've also had some look at me and say, oh, God loves you no matter what. So, but you just have to be like this, and then he'll love you, and he'll love you no matter what. So it's like, I well, guess I definitely haven't, but I, I've also been friends with a lot of people who have been religious and have gone through things, mm-hmm. and I know one of my friends specifically in when we were in middle school, um, her parents were going through a divorce, and I remember we once were sitting down and she told me about how every night she like prayed to God that her parents would get back together, and it never happened, so she it's so fascinating to me, right? I wanted a thing. I asked God for it. I didn't get the thing I wanted. And I was like, no more God. Which I feel like a lot of people, that's how a lot of people approach their faith. That is totally relatable, but at the same time seems not a healthy way to uh, of approaching the whole thing. Yes, ma'am. Um, so my understanding, my life has been based on this, is I think God is supposed to have a belief and God does. I think the issue arises when people who believe in God speak on their behalf. On God's, be- God's, God's behalf? behalf. If 
Well, it sounds like in your case, you've been getting mixed messages from God's self-appointed, you know, salesman. Also, for me, I, I've never really seen God as a person. Mm-hmm. Like, I've always just seen God as more of an idea, since I've never really believed in it or been, mm-hmm. like, you know, super into religion or anything like that. Right. I've it's not been personalized for you. Yeah. I think I think that's a that's a widely held idea by some people. Yeah. I think there's also something to say as uh, for people who see God as like less of a person and more of like a force. Like people who say they see God as the universe or see God as nature, um, and like if we're asking the question in that way, then I like if you felt the presence of God. Felt the presence of like the universe and kind of had that realization kind of crash down on you. Uh, I would think that's what you think too. Absolutely. I think that for those of us who believe in God, I'm one of these people. I think that it is, it's interesting to me that if you have a feeling about what God is or how God is or, you know, what that personality is like. Folks seem very invested in other people sharing their vision of God, right? Like that seems, it's very disturbing to someone who passionately believes in God if someone has different ideas about what God is. And that is itself interesting to me. Because I'm not sure that people Mm, get similarly invested about other things. They do to a certain degree. They do to a certain degree. A political figure, it matters to people who passionately believe in Biden or passionately believe in Trump that other people see the Biden or Trump that they see, right? So people do have, there is this phenomena and other belief of course, if you're talking about a, an entity, a force, that is not physically demonstrable in the way that other people are physically demonstrable, then maybe our sense that others share our view of God becomes greater, higher, stronger. There was, I thought I saw a hand over this way. I could, of course, be imagining that hand. We'll come back to this in just a second. The rag picker on page 258, one of my favorite characters, by the way. The rag picker tells Sutri on the previous page that an old man's days are ours. Sutri asks, what happens then? When, the rag picker says. After you're dead, don't nothing happen. You're dead. You told me once you believed in God. The old man waved his hand. Maybe, he said. I got no reason to think he believes in me. Oh, I'd like to see him for a minute if I could. What would you say to him? Well, I think I'd just tell him. I'd say, wait a minute. Wait just one minute before you start in on me. Before you say anything, there's just one thing I'd like to know. And he'll say, what's that? And then I'm going to ask him, What did you have me in that crap game down there for anyway? I couldn't put any part of it together. Sutri smiled. What do you think he'll say? The rag picker spat and wiped his mouth. I don't believe he can answer it, he said. I don't believe there is an answer. The rag picker has this man who's 
I guess we would say homeless, right? So he's living under a bridge. Um, he's funny. Uh, in addition to being funny, he's, he comes off as like very bitter and he longs for death. I, I wonder if, and maybe these two things aren't incompatible, if one can believe in both God and nothingness. The rag picker seems to long for a kind of nothingness. Don't nothing happen, right? But before he's expressed in a belief in God, now he says maybe, which makes him seem like a lot of human beings to me, that, that you know, our belief... Our belief um, fluctuates from day to day. Previous to that, they're talking about ventriloquism, right? One of the first things we're told about the rag picker, Sutri thinks he could make the dolls to talk, right? So, you know, he's a ventriloquist. He had a little dummy and he makes. Are there still ventriloquists? I say this word now and I wonder if people know what I'm talking about. Right? Does everyone know what a ventriloquist is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of a tired bit. You know, it's a, it's a person that becomes really good at speaking without moving their mouth. It's kind, of, it's kind of tired, right? It's kind of a tired bit. But there were famous ventriloquists in the late 19th and early 20th century. I suppose there's still Jeff Dunham, and someone somewhere thinks he's funny. <laughs> I've, I just haven't met them. Um, yeah. But I think ventriloquism is a very, very interesting idea, particularly when we're talking about fiction writing and Cormac and everything. If you're a really, really high-level fiction writer, what you are is a ventriloquist who uses written language. And you're able to pitch your voice in such a way that you can capture the voices of all these people, the rag picker and Ab Jones and Sutri and Harrogate, on and on and on. You can do so credibly and convincingly and in a way that's entertaining, right? I always heard about, when I was growing up, expressing yourself as if that were a good thing when people would say they, they want to express themselves. I never, I never wanted to do that. I never wanted to express myself. Um, I wanted to express someone else. I wanted to learn to pitch my voice in such a way that it would be convincing. And from the time I was really, really small, I, I would start, I just did voices. I would hear anything, like any voice, and some I did better than others, but like people would be like, oh my gosh, you know, do that again, do that again, right? And like that voice imitating thing, that kind of mockingbird parrot quality was something that I was um, geared toward, geared toward from a, from a very young age, right? And Cormac is a bit of a ventriloquist himself, obviously, right? He pitches his voice in a convincing way. Um, it might be said that there is a view of God as a ventriloquist who pitches his voice in various ways through the puppet is called a dummy. I think that's a kind of a fascinating concept. It's also true that ventriloquist dummies are inherently spooky. I'm not sure exactly why. Maybe for the reason that maybe it's the uncanny valley doll thing that that you know we're a little creeped out by it. It's yeah. it's they need to be a, the dolls need to be or the dummies need to be a bit less human-like. Um, maybe that's why, and this is not exactly the same because these are, these are puppeteers. Jim Henson is like under the table. This is why like Grover or Elmo is not creepy, right? Where if Elmo looked more like a person and less like an Elmo, <laughs> right? Maybe we wouldn't think he's so cute. Yoda would be creepy if Jim Henson was sitting there with Yoda on his lap doing the Yoda voice out the side of his mouth, right? But they made, they made Yoda not look like, they just made his eyes human. They gave him Einstein's eyes, right, famously. Hmm. 
I guess if you wanted to express yourself, you might write poetry. I suppose poetry is a way of expressing oneself. As a fiction writer, when someone says, don't you want to express yourself, or do you like to express yourself, my first thought immediately is, which one? Right? A novelist contains multitudes. And you have characters inside you. You have, you know, and I'm not interested in what people think of me. I'm interested in making interesting and entertaining things for them. So I'm not interested in what people think of me. I'm interested in what people think of the things I've created, which is different from me since I'm since I'm not expressing myself. I don't know what self I don't know what self there is to express at the same time. It's an interesting idea. Now, go back for a second. When Sutri is in melee combat and he gets a floor buffer dropped on his head, he begins to see things that one wouldn't think necessarily reside inside of us. You know, the crone, the figure of this this witchly kind of woman who laughs at him, right? Harrogate, who in, in duress, you know, low on sleep and injured and concussed, begins to think that there are these kind of demonic figures. I, I suspect that McCarthy believed that these hallucinations or whatever you want to call them, hallucinations or visions, delusions, these things that people encounter um, are real to some extent, right? And that madness or injury or psychedelics or whatever is like a lens that enables us to see them, right? And that all these things kind of exist simultaneously, which would gel with some of the things that he believes about physics and the sciences of complexity. Um, what is significant about Sutri being in that big barroom brawl? I mean, and what a brawl, too. It seems like some great Greek battle. It's melee combat. Um, Sutri feels out of place to me because of his, in that context, right? Because he's very intelligent, very articulate. He's, he has um, a lot of feeling and emotion and um, care, concern. What's significant about Sutri being in the, in the context of like a melee? getting a floor buffer dropped on his head. I think the context about that is, I think the idea is what he's trying to get home is like, because again, he's in these groups, he is still, he, they have him around because again, he's so, you were talking about the, uh, the clicks before and how he's the person very much not like himself. And I think this is, I think there's a few other scenes that might also hand, it, ha hand this home. I don't know if that's proper wording. Yeah, yeah. But, because uh, like for uh, earlier, I believe with, uh, earlier he was like rejecting, you know, drinking, uh, point as well and I think it's kind of I think it's made to basically to put him in a place to give him I'm trying to figure out how to word this uh, to put him in this place where he, uh, he realized or he, he the point is he's out of place this is not in a sense his group but even among his group he's in a sense an outsider why do guys like to drink and then go out and get into get into fights and bars I'm not saying all guys but why why is there a type of guy I had friends used to play a game the, the game, uh, don't play this game. I don't want <laughs> The game was called Punch That Face. <laughs> right? And in Punch That Face, don't play this game. You go to a bar, you have a couple of shots, you sit there, you look around the room, and you turn to your buddy and go, you see that dude over there? Yeah? Punch that face. And you're supposed to, don't play this game. You're supposed to go over there and punch that face, and then you just kind of you just kind of ride out the night. Just ride out the night. You know, take, you know, 
you go where the night takes you after that. Now, someone like myself never would have done such a thing, <laughs> but others, others have been known to do it. No. I think what I was Petri was kind of saying like he doesn't care or that he's like very nonchalant like everybody else is like it, it, it. yes he wants to be an unfeeling kind of brute just get messed up and a man of a man of the, the sensations but he has this other thing going on with his mind yeah Right. And is very capable of expressing his feelings, but amongst his friend group, it's not exactly socially acceptable for any of them to really talk about their feelings. They don't talk about how sad they are out there shouting early times at each other. Too, yeah, yeah. They, and they don't talk about whether like they care about each other, right? So to show that care and appreciation, they right. fight people for each other. Yeah. Cat. Yeah, it's interesting because we become, to a certain degree, accustomed to a kind of, because of the prevalence of mixed martial arts in the UFC, we become accustomed to a certain kind of fight that seems real, and it's real in the sense that it, it, it's a legit athletic competition with guys who are incredibly uh, skilled, very gifted athletes, and insane um, physical condition, just the, the whole thing, right? Um, it's not like a street fight. It's just different, right? At the moment that you're fighting a guy that, ha you know, from the same weight class, you're, you have, your hands have been professionally taped and you're wearing gloves and you're in an octagon that has a mat that gives when you're taken down and there's a referee to stop the fight and there's a cut man in your corner and there are medics and the surface you're fighting on is perfectly flat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Any, any variable, and there are things you can't do. You can't fish hook someone. You can't eye gouge someone. You can't headbutt someone. You can't target the groin. I don't, not suggesting anyone go out and do any of those things. I'm saying that it's not the same as a street fight where there is this enormous sense of anything could happen. Also, there are no weapons in the octagon, right? You can't, you know, pick up a chair leg or a floor buffer and hit, you know, hit someone over the head with it. Ivy? Uh, I did competitive martial arts for what is now half my life. Mm -hmm. And it's, I guess, the difference is like, I don't like with that training. I don't just go around being like, oh, I could, I could kick your ass. It's like if there's rules, like I'm, I have the skill and I have the right. training and all that. Right, it's context. It's, yeah, as it's soon context. As you take away all those rules and traditions and the history and the honor. Right. I'm getting my ass beat because I'm trying to do all this normal stuff, and here I am getting hit in the head with this machinery. Well, yeah. Right? Like, I mean, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. Like mix, like bad yeah, day, like I have the bad day from anyone, bad right. day for anyone, right? And there's this other variable, which is if you're fighting one person, even in a street fight. I mean, every variable you change is a new world, right? Take away the mat, uneven concrete you know, of a parking lot where there's little bits of gravel and glass, things to trip over, cars things people can take your head and ram into, like all that kind of stuff, right? Um, but fighting more than one person, right, is a crazy thing to do, right? Because you're not only thinking about this person in front of you, and, you're, and it's not a competition. You're, you're not fighting for a medal or a purse, or right? You are trying to hurt that other person, and they're trying to hurt you, and you don't get anything for it and you may all go to jail no matter what, right? So you have to worry about like, 
Like in the UFC, in a fight, you and someone else, no one's coming up behind you and hitting you over the head with something. But I mean, a guy in this particular melee has a slapjack, and there's that sickening sound of a piece of lead inside a length of leather smacking against people's skulls. It's just, oh, right? Like instant knockout, just wham, 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 concussion, concussion, concussion. Um, so like Sutri is entered into a kind of battle and a kind of battle where, I mean, guys will kind of, to a certain degree, even in the parking lot of a bar, guys will sometimes police what goes on. If someone like puts someone down and starts stomping on their face, sometimes guys will step in, sometimes not. And then everything can go wrong. Someone can pull out a gun and just start shooting. Someone can pull out a knife. You know, all these terrible things can occur, right? Um, and after everything, like Sutri's friends, you can end up in jail. Sutri ends up in um, the hospital with a nurse, you know, cleaning blood out of his eyes and he's seeing double. And it's just like, ugh. Also, I mean, an extreme case of Sutri being where he doesn't belong. And the nurse says an interesting thing. Aren't you ashamed? And, and he thinks, like, he's trying to be one of, these, one of these hooligans he's running with, right? And he says, ashamed of what? She's like, ashamed of being in a fight like that. Like, aren't you ashamed of yourself? Like, what's, what's going on with you, man? And that, what's going on with you, like, is the persistent question mm -hmm. of the book. Right? It's, it's the one that we started off asking. It's the one that we're going to be carrying forward a little bit. The next section we'll read, Sutri goes to see a witch and has an experience. And so we'll delve into, I wanted to do the, the sort of Catholic search for meaning today and then there will be the, I suppose, pagan search for, for answers and meaning. Mm -hmm.